podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lila Saperstein, and this is the show where we talk about audiology and also related fields, speech pathology, and basically anything around communication. And we have many families listening to the show, many professionals, and lots of students as well of communication sciences. So I think this one's for you, my dear students, listeners of the show. We've had podcasts uh, talking about medical SLPs and practice and school and all the different things that our amazing speech language pathology colleagues do. And I'm excited to continue that conversation with today's guest. Mira Dieters is a speech language pathologist. It's going to give us a lot of information, insight, and advice. So welcome to the show, Mira. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm happy to be here. I'm very excited. I'd love to hear first a little bit about your background and how you even heard about speech language pathology and what was your your kind of journey to become one. Sure. So I've been practicing as a speech pathologist for 14 years. So I honestly can't believe it's been that long. It's gone by super fast. I actually didn't know anything about speech pathology or it's also called speech therapy. After high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college in terms of majoring, in terms of studying. So my dad actually had been working with speech therapists at the hospital. So he's a radiologist and he'd been working with speech therapists at the hospital he would consult with them on swallow studies. So when people have trouble with swallowing, oftentimes they may get an imaging study, which involves a speech therapist and a radiologist together. So my dad actually suggested I come to the hospital and said, hey, why don't you see what speech pathologists do? You can figure out if that's something you'd like or not. Let's just see what you think. So I said, all right. So I actually spent a total of two weeks at the hospital just observing what speech pathologists occupational therapists and physical therapists all do. And I have so much respect for my colleagues and coworkers, and I've met all kinds of cool um, audiologists and occupational therapists and physical therapists. But really, I mean, I don't feel like I'm that strong physically. And I thought, wow, to be an occupational therapist or physical therapist would be personally pretty hard for me. I don't know if that's something that I would be good at. But the second I saw what a speech therapist does, Literally, I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And right away, I thought to myself, man, I want to be the person who's helping someone with their communication. And I still remember to this day, I mean, this kind of gives me goosebumps even now because I was actually shadowing with speech therapist at the hospital and she had gone into some kind of intensive care unit. So I remember we had to gown up to see the patient and he had suffered some kind of wounds. And I remember she was helping him with voice therapy. And so she was helping him figure out, you know, how he could use his voice to communicate. And I just found it so fascinating. And what I still find fascinating about the field is that there's just so many different areas you can specialize in. And honestly, you can never get bored. So it's really just great and very fascinating. That's so good. That's such a good opportunity that you were able to have that shadowing, you know, observing time. And I also always recommend that to anyone who's considering should I do audiology or speech or what should I mm-hmm. just go just like call up the clinic or hospital and try to figure out how to get a couple hours observation or even longer. And not only that, it gets you kind of relationships and networking as well, which mm-hmm. is also very helpful. Mm-hmm. So I do want to give people opportunity to even like go on YouTube or go on Instagram and like look up. Oh, modified barium swallow studies. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Yes. So like or just MBS that. for short. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can see it's really cool because it's an x-ray of someone swallowing. Like uh-huh. that's it's uh-huh. an, is it an x-ray? It is. Uh-huh. It is, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it is very cool. You can kind of see the tongue moving and the swallowing. So if you don't have the opportunity to actually observe it, you could still check it out online. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. I agree. <laughs> That's like another part of the podcast. And what we're doing here is that you can connect with people all around the world from different professions and kind of do some of this work, especially in a post-pandemic life when a lot of things are online. There's still so much opportunity for this kind of questioning and looking on Instagram hashtags. Definitely Instagram is where I hang out at All About Audiology Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I was recently talking about that that. Facebook can get really overwhelming and maybe ranty. It's like, it's got a different energy. And then Twitter is like so quick and short and you have to be punchy. And Instagram was like right in that sweet spot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, have, you have captions, you have images, and you can 
kind of make a full point without it getting out of hand. I don't know. So I'm a fan of Instagram. <laughs> anyway, back to back to your journey. So did you major in speech therapy is what happened then in college? Well, technically, yeah, that's actually an interesting story. I did not. I actually majored in sociology. So I went to school in San Antonio in Texas. And I majored in sociology and I knew during college that I wanted to become a speech therapist, but the school I went to didn't have the program. So what I actually did after that was I went to another school, uh, TCU, it was a, it's a private school in Fort Worth, and I did a year of leveling classes. So essentially, if you don't do an undergraduate major, major in communication disorders, yes, like me, you can still become a speech therapist. They require you to take a year of classes. So it's almost like getting another bachelor's, but they call it leveling courses. And then once you complete that year of courses, before the end of that, you can apply for graduate programs. Yeah, we had that when I studied at Brooklyn College, they called it post back, like people who had finished mm-hmm. their bachelor's and then come into right. classes. But there was always a major scramble of who can get in and the classes were so competitive to even just get into the classes. Oh, that wow. Was, that was, yeah, there was a a lot of competition and there was like a hierarchy, you know, the, the seniors would have first dibs because they yeah. had to graduate. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the post back students were, were like kind of last on the list. And so it was always tough, but we had big classes anyway. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any idea of what you want to specialize in or which? No, I really didn't going? have that figured out except until a few months ago during the pandemic when I decided, Hey, I have all this free time on my hands. Maybe I should go after certifications. And that actually eventually led me to start my own practice, which is called Super Speech Solutions. So the interesting thing about that is two things. So one, I'm not someone who knew what they wanted to specialize in. I only feel like I figured it out the past few months. So I know a lot of students probably out there think, hey, I need to know that. Well, you can figure it out along in the field as time goes on. And you don't even have to technically specialize in anything. It could be what people call a generalist. You can still see you know, some people call it womb to tomb. You could see kids from very early in life <laughs> until the very end of life. So not to say that you have to specialize. Um, I personally specialize in language disorders, autism and accent modification. So I actually see children as well as adults, which I really like. It's a nice mix for me. That's great. So you're seeing patients privately now, but what were you doing, you know, in, in the last what was it, 13 years before? Yeah, before that. So I've actually worked in a lot of different settings. I actually started out on the medical side and I was working with adults for the first five years of my career. So when I first started, I was in a cancer hospital and then I went to a skilled nursing facility. And then after that, I went to, was an in and outpatient rehab for people who have brain injuries and strokes. Then after that, I transitioned to pediatrics, which now I've done for nine years. So I've worked in a lot of different settings, even in terms of pediatrics, I've worked in different uh, private practices that other people have owned through one of those private practices that we actually contract with charter schools as well. So I feel like I've kind of been all over the map. And then, of course, a few months ago, I started my own private practice. So I almost feel like I'm one of those people who can check off multiple boxes, like what settings have you worked in? I've worked in a lot of different ones. Yeah, that's so important that not only do you not have to choose, you can also change later Mm -hmm. on or or throughout your career. Mm-hmm. So are you working mostly on Zoom these days? Is that is it telehealth or do you have a physical practice? Um, I, yeah, I mostly, well, I actually initially started out mostly working on Zoom because of the pandemic. I actually recently have transitioned to doing in-home sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't actually have a physical office right now, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be getting one anytime soon because I think it's important to keep your overhead costs to a minimum, especially when you're first starting out a business. So yeah, right now I just started in home sessions, you know, now that things are um, where I am in Texas, you know, unfortunately not everywhere in the world are things better with COVID. We hope that continues to be the first time. Uh, Where I am, things certainly have gotten better. Although surprisingly, not even 40% of the population even here locally is vaccinated, but anyhow, things have gotten better. So now I feel comfortable going in homes uh, within a certain radius from where I am. I think the good thing about doing that is, first of all, I will say that online speech therapy is not something that's going to be good for everyone. So especially for kids who, my opinion, are five and under or even six and under, they're not going to participate on the screen. That's going to be a lot of parent coaching. Um, I think for, you know, if you're doing speech therapy on Zoom or any kind of therapy on Zoom, I think it's easier for kids who are older and certainly for teenagers, adults, you know, as you go all the way up in the age range. 
I think for younger kids, it's really important to be face to face because a lot of what you're doing when kids are young is play based therapy. And so you really are relying more on cues from the speech therapist or looking at their body language. And the added bonus of going in someone's home is that you really get an idea of what their environment is like. It's more functional. Yeah, that's so important. So I'd love to hear more about um, the work you do, kids with autism and any other you know, pediatric patients you're seeing and what also specifically what parents, you know, who have a speech therapist coming into the home, what you would want them to know about and hear from you. Sure. Yeah. What, what are you that's... actually looking at when you come in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what do we really do? So yeah. I think that's great for parents to know what speech therapists do, especially in working with children who are autistic or children who have autism, you know, as we know, that's a very wide spectrum disorder. So there's a whole bunch of things we can do in terms of speech therapy. But I would say the main area that we're going to be concentrating on when we're working with autistic children is language. So even within the area of language, we could be working on receptive language, which is more like answering questions and following directions. Or we, you know, oftentimes work on expressive language where maybe the child is only using a couple words. Maybe they're not using words, but essentially you're trying to have them put multiple words together in a phrase or sentence in order to communicate. But if they're done with all of those areas, typically we could be working a lot on pragmatics or social language. Social skills are really important. A lot of times it can be difficult for autistic children to make friends because they don't necessarily pick up on nonverbal cues, or they may not be able to rephrase something and understand that someone's not understanding what they're saying. So there are a lot of different things that we can do in speech therapy. Um, I think it's really important for the parent to know session to session what's happening, uh, what's happening with the child in terms of their behavior, but also what the speech therapist is working on. Um, in private practice, you know, personally, that's actually my favorite setting now, really, because I have the most contact with parents. And typically if the parent, you know, if I don't have direct contact with the parent, it might be a nanny or caregiver. Or what I like about that setting is that you have really good communication with the parent or caregiver of the child and you can constantly know what's going on. I think the disadvantage of the school setting is that you don't necessarily have contact with the parent. You have more contact with the teacher, which is just a different source in that sense. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think it's important to for parents to know what they can work on with their child at home. And I really like to give functional ways they can work on things. You know, I think a lot of times you can, you know, you, know, you can say, oh, well, you can spend, you know, a lot of parents don't have time. I mean, we typically do half an hour sessions or longer. Parents don't have time to sit there for half an hour and work with their child on something by itself. So I really try to tell them something functional. Like, let's say the child is working on, introducing new topics. You know, I might tell them something like, hey, why don't you work on that and play it as a game during mealtime? And each person has to introduce a new topic. So what happens with kids is almost of any age, if you can put things in terms of a game, it's much more fun. You get much more buy-in. Yeah, I think that's true for everybody across the lifespan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, yeah, try to gamify Productivity, that's one thing I've, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been looking into. Gamify, well. I love that word. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> it, you're right. <laughs> yeah, incentivize, could be like even Fitbit, you know, everybody walking mm -hmm. around like trying to track their steps. At a certain point, yes. it's like we should not be tracking everything, but mm -hmm. there, it's very motivating to kind of see that counter go up. Although after it a few is. months, I, I, I take breaks from the Fitbit and then say, Actually, I had a good day. And then I look at the Fitbit and it's like, did I? Did I walk enough? And yeah. it's like, this is not the worth of my day, but it's a tool. It's a tool. So right. <laughs> there, there I go on my tangents. But I think it's uh, like another question I'm thinking parents might have is, uh -huh. you know, you're coming into my home and um, maybe I didn't clean up from breakfast and maybe like there's a thousand toys everywhere. Like, is it pressure that sometimes parents feel like you're coming into the home and I have to like prepare or make sure things are in order? Like, I, yeah, I think it could be. I mean, I can see that because personally, if I think about from their perspective, when I have people come, you know, when my husband and I have people come into our own house, I mean, we're very particular about cleaning and things like that. So I can see how someone, you know, a parent especially may have that in the back of their mind. But honestly, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me. I mean... You know, home environment is a home environment. And typically, 
you know, a lot of the people that I'm working with have more than one kid. It's not going to be nice and clean and pretty. That's not the reality of what having kids looks like. So I think for all the parents who are listening, any speech therapist, including myself, we're really not concerned about that. We know that, you know, real life happens. We don't expect homes to look a certain way. We really just want to go in and help the child and, you know, help the parent understand what we're working on as best we can. That's really our goal. Okay, good. Phew. I can relax. About that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a few questions about accent modification in that sure. part of your work. I think there's like a certain element of the person has to be motivated and want their accent to change yes. for this yes. to kind of be ethical. And the uh-huh. other side of it might be like, you know, oppressive, like, oh, your accent isn't good or whatever. So there's like also a lot of other conversations around that. Uh-huh. How do you handle that? How do you handle that? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I mean, I think it's hard for someone to come see a speech therapist and say, hey, I really want to work on my communication. You know, I'm having trouble with people understanding me. What I find is that because it's an elective service, people will come seek me out for that particular area, number one. Number two, what I think is amazing is the very last client I had, his employer was actually reimbursing him for the services. And I just thought it was so cool that his wow. employer, he was working at an oil and gas um, company at the time. Um, his employer, I just thought it was so cool that they found the importance of that. You know, obviously understood what we were doing, understood how important it was, and were actually paying him back and because he was paying out of pocket because, of course, insurance doesn't cover an elective service like that. And that's only for adults? Have you ever seen It's typically for more for... I I usually haven't. It's usually more for adults. I mean, not to say that children or teenagers wouldn't come for that, but typically I find that more adults will come for that. And usually I find that these are very high performing individuals in the workplace and they are coming for accent modification or sometimes it's called accent reduction. They mean the same thing because they want to be able to move up in the workplace and they feel like not being understood is actually holding them back. Number one at work and number two, sometimes socially as well as what I've heard too. That's very interesting. You know, what's what's coming to mind for me in the conversations of like anti-racism and, mm-hmm. you know, not not imp- infringing on people's cultural, you know, an accent is not a bad thing. And then reduction to what? To, mm-hmm. you know, a different kind of standard, and how accents are different across the world. Like I can see how some people might view that as problematic, but <laughs> I'm not trying to stir up controversy. I'm just kind of having well, I agree with what you're talking, saying because you know I, mean? I think you know generally if you talk about modification or reduction it's like oh you have to alter what you're currently doing so yeah there could be i can see how there would be you know could be a stigma associated with that and the other thing too is sometimes in some of the courses that i've done or you know they might talk about the american way of talking or speaking and mm-hmm. i mean you know it is what it is it's like america is a melting pot i mean i myself grew up in canada you know i'm third generation indian i mean i you know also live in the united states shore too but i have family that's all over the world including in india you know england everywhere and i think lots of people are very international in nature so I don't really like that term. I mean, I feel like we need to call it something else. So like, if you look on my website, I don't have accent modification, accent reduction. I try to term it differently because to me, it just sounds very kind of demeaning and like, oh, that's not what I'm really doing. I'm trying to help someone, not trying to make them sound better or trying to make them sound different. Like, that's not it. And I like the way that you also framed it before about helping someone be intelligible. Yeah. So that, you know, that that would be the goal. Rather, I guess, than the the Hollywood version of like, oh, I'm doing a movie and I need a different accent. You know? Right. I mean, that's yeah. something separate. Of course, people can seek speech therapists out for that too, but that's not really what we're talking about right now. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's so interesting and so, so much fun. It <laughs> my, is. It is pretty my phonetic, fun. My phonetics class in undergrad was one of my favorite because I just thought it was, it was basically word games and mm-hmm. just like learning the international phonetic alphabet was like, puzzles and I was all over it. Yeah. It was my favorite class. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a cool class too. Yeah, I didn't get it in college, but I did take it in my leveling courses after to, for, to get into grad school. And yeah, I still actually, um, from one of the conferences I went to, yeah, I have a, a mug that says I'm a speech therapist, but it's written in IPA and in international phonetic alphabet. So it just looks cool because you can't read it unless like, you know how to read it. So <laughs> Yeah. And then I saw an Instagram post once that said, 
you'll read anything if it's written in IPA. Pretty <laughs> much, yeah. And you're like, yep. <laughs> by the time you get to the end, you're like, oh man, I fell for it. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty fun class. It's pretty interesting. And I think it's also important for students to hear that, of course, college and any studies you do are taxing and difficult and take a lot of effort, but maybe you could find some fun. And there we're back to gamifying your studies. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. No, that is one of the things I learned in grad school. So honestly, grad school, I think no matter what your program you're in, is really hard. It's more intense. You definitely have more reading, more studying. But similar to what you're saying, if you can come up with those cool acronyms to remember like the 12 cranial nerves or whatever you're learning, it's so much more fun and so much easier to remember them too. So should I put you on the spot? <laughs> I don't remember what the phrase is anymore. I was trying to think. I wonder. I thought, oh, I bet she's gonna ask me that now. Uh oh, sorry. We can cut that out if you prefer, but <laughs> no, I, I sort of remember it. It was something about oh my gosh, it was something about like a Finn and a German somehow end up on like Mount Olym. I don't remember. It was really random. Like I didn't make it up, someone else did. <laughs> Well, it worked for the test, you know. It did, um, it did. Clearly not after, but I mean, now I haven't been in school in what, like 15 years, so. That's quite all right. I was just talking with my seven-year-old today. On the way home from school, she told me about her uh -huh. spelling test. Uh, she had a spelling test with five words. This is in first grade. Uh -huh. And I asked her to spell one of the words. And she was like, you think I remember? The test is over. <laughs> Out of sight, out of mind. Yes. Uh, I was like, oh, oh we got to get on this mindset real, real quick. Nip this in the bud. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that can happen. Can happen. So I think that's going to be our listener question. So the listeners, uh, if you will send an, a message to me on Instagram with the 12 cranial nerves and the sentence you use to remember that, <laughs> then I, I will do a giveaway for the winner. I don't know what I'm giving away, but that will be a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually curious myself now to look it up and remember what it is too. So. Great. And then I'll <laughs> compile everyone's answers and make a post. It's going to be perfect. This is awesome. And I'm sure um, there are lots of different <laughs> ones, right? Because everybody tends to come up with a different acronym that works for them. So exactly. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Would there be anything else that uh, you'd like to say for, for all of our listeners? Any advice? Oh, another or, thing yeah. I wanted to mention to students, I know another thing that I thought was really key for me was I actually, from another speech therapist, got the advice to start working with adults and then transition to working with kids later. And the reason I really appreciate that advice is because, number one, I think it would be hard if you do want to transition going from pediatrics to adults because they're two completely different worlds. But I also think that if you can do both, you are more marketable as a speech therapist or really as any therapist, because most people don't work with both populations. So I think, you know, it's fun, I think, because you have even much more variety, but also because, like I said, a lot of people can't do both. So you can step into both worlds. I think that's a big advantage, too. Can you say more about why it's harder to go from kids up to adults rather than the other way around? So he said. Um, yeah, that's that's really interesting that you ask. I mean, honestly, I haven't given it too much thought, but I really think it's because, well, each population is so specialized. Personally, I think the way I did it was easy because I think working with adults in some ways is harder. And of course, your paperwork is going to look different. The tests and everything you're doing is different. Mm -hmm. Nature of the therapy you're doing is really different. To me, it's it's really rewarding, but I think it can also be more intense depending on what you're working on, especially on the medical side. So I think from a mental standpoint, you might find it more challenging in terms of being, at least that's what it was for me. I mean, as much as I loved it, after working with people at brain injuries and strokes for almost three years, I said, wow, I really enjoy this. And I love my coworkers and I love the field, but I can't keep doing this. Like I would come home exhausted because you yeah. can see so much and you know, a lot of times you're coaching people, right? Like, unfortunately, their loved one has experienced a very, you know, they have become a very different person. Yeah. And that may, they may not eventually, come, you know, go back to who they were before. Very difficult, very challenging to see. But I, like I said, I have so much respect for, you know, I still keep in touch with my coworkers from that particular job. 
Um, and then for me, you know, I guess because I think it's different if you're on the medical pediatric side, but since I'm not on the medical pediatric side, I'm speaking more to the side of, you know, school age kids and middle school, high schoolers. And like mm-hmm. I said, because I'm not really on the medical side, to me, it's more, it's uh, very rewarding as well. I think I just love working with kids more. I think it just kind of comes down to that. Like, I enjoy it. I think to me, it's more like playing games and I found it harder to see as playing games when I was working with adults. Like it's a bit more focused to what they want to achieve. Yeah. I felt the same when I was seeing also adults and children in the audiology clinics. Um, Definitely the time just goes faster when you're Uh trying to do a circus show and get the kids to do (laughs) it. Like you're becoming really animated and and doing less. And yeah, you're part of the entertainment, but yeah. I think I like doing that. So I'm like, hey, this is fun. <laughs> Teach me about video games. I still don't know. <laughs> yeah, I learned so much from our patients. And then mm-hmm. with adults, I feel like what you mentioned before is that it, it can also be so difficult because they have changed or yeah. they're experiencing, you know, in, in the terms of the hearing loss and coming to accept that and, and come to terms with it and learn how to deal with the hearing aid. Some of that rehab is, you know, it's a different energy, definitely, it in is. the appointments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you need a lot of patience and a lot of, you know, finesse to be able to, like, yes. also, especially as a young audiologist, I uh-huh. felt that there was, uh-huh. you know, it was much easier for me to, to be, like, young and excited with young kids and their families than older patients sometimes looking at me like, you're the doctor? I don't know, you were 12. <laughs> right, yeah, no, I can understand that feeling. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's really, really interesting advice and so encouraging. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, if any of our listeners want to learn more about your work or where, you know, be in touch with you, where can they find you online? So I am on social media and I know we're mentioning Instagram. So first I will say I'm on Instagram. My name on there is Super Speech Solutions. And also on Facebook, my business page is Super Speech Solutions, LLC. I'm also on LinkedIn, same, Super Speech Solutions, LLC. And then the best way to reach me is my email address. It's my first name, Mira, M-E-E-R-A, at superspeechsolutions.com. So feel free to send me a message if you have any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. And I really look forward to hearing people's acronyms for the 12 cranial nerves as well, <laughs> as, well as any other feedback from today's conversation. So you can find us also on Facebook and Instagram and at allaboutaudiology.com, where you will also find a full transcript of today's conversation and all the previous episodes of the All About Audiology podcast. Thank you to our patrons and supporters. If you would like to become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash allaboutaudiology, and I will talk to you all very soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.